So thank you so much for being here, Judge Sebutinde. It's really a big honor for me to interview you here. Um, I'd like to ask you a few questions and they're quite difficult, uh, different from each other. So, well, we'll see how that goes. Um, first of all, when we look at your resume, we see that you've had a lot of high and important positions, both on a national level and on an international level. And also, if I'm correct, you were the first African woman to ever be elected on the International Court of Justice. Um, if you think about all this, do you see yourself as a, a, a role model or as an empowerer of African women? Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, in that, of course, there'll be other people looking to me, uh, trying to follow my footsteps, and that is a good thing. Um, younger people will always aspire. People who probably thought, or women who thought, some of the things I did were impossible to do. They now um, know that it's possible to do those things. So in that regard, yes, I am a role model. But no, in that I just feel that as an individual, as a lawyer, as a woman, um, this is what I needed to do at this time. All the different uh, assignments that I've had to do, uh, I feel privileged that I had the, the opportunity to do them, both nationally and internationally. Uh, but I gave it my best shot, and I still am giving it my best shot. Um, to be an effective lawyer uh, in, in the various assignments that have been given, and all of which have been different, as you observed, but very vital to the, the communities where I've been serving. Nationally, we've had our issues in the country, and the, the commissions of inquiry that I was involved in um, entailed uh, a lot of corruption on the part of public service providers and resulting in a denial of, of human rights very often. So for me as a person inquiring um, into these, these uh, anomalies, I felt that I was, I was uh, fulfilling the hope of citizens that otherwise would not have a voice. Now, on, on the international scene, um, as you saw from my resume, I, I worked as a war crimes judge in the court of Sierra Leone. And there also uh, I felt that I was contributing as an individual um, to the peacemaking process in, in uh, Sierra Leone and to bringing justice for the victims of the conflict of Sierra Leone. Now, as a judge of the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, one of the key motivating factors for me as, as a woman, as an African woman, was where I come from. I come from a region in, in, in East Africa, or in Central Eastern Africa, called the Great Lakes region. And this is a region that has been renowned for conflict, internal conflict, um, interstate conflict, etc. And usually in a conflict, women, suffer, women and children are most vulnerable and they suffer a lot. There are many um, internally displaced people. There are many refugees across states. And this is a region that has really been hounded by gross violation of human rights, of which women and children have suffered most. And I felt that as a woman, as a judge, as a lawyer, what could I do? What could, what could I, how could I use uh, my, my, my training, my role, um, in order to bring about peaceful resolution? of disputes between states. And I found that this court, the International Court of Justice, is one avenue where that can be done. But the big question was, why were there few women mm -hmm. on this bench? And much less so, why weren't there any African women on the bench? And for me, this was a motivating factor. I wanted to get inside the court to see how the court operates. Why do not many African states refer their disputes? Why do they choose to fight rather than to bring disputes to court? And, and so on and so forth. What could I learn during my term uh, on the bench of the ICJ? And do you think there will be more uh, African judges, female judges uh, in the court in the future? I don't see why not. The door has now been opened. And, and I think whatever myths um, were out there, and I must tell you, I too was sometimes holding on to those myths that it's, it's impossible. Um, for 64 years, as you know, this court only had men on it. It was called a UN World Court, but there was nothing, nothing united. There was nothing 
um, world about it. Half of the world was not represented on the court. The half meaning the women were never on this court until as late as 2010 or, or late 90s when the first woman judge, um, uh, first woman judge from Britain, um, Dame Higgins, joined the court. So all, all these were myths. You know, you look at it, it's, it's a court made up of elderly, uh, diplomatic, bureaucratic gentlemen. And uh, what business does anybody else have with this court? They are the ones that make the decisions for the world, for countries and for states. So, but these were all myths um, uh, because as, as we've seen more and more, more women have joined the court. They're just as able as men. And I think it's better for the countries from where we all come from to recognize that this is a forum where um, state interstate disputes can be peacefully resolved rather than people op opting for conflict. Yes, I think it's a very important step, definitely, and also in the empowerment of women in general, because the, you see often that the diplomatic world in general, also uh, ambassadors, it's really a men's world, and only in recent times you see that the women are coming up. Um, yeah, you already touched a bit on the subject of human rights, and you received a honorary degree for, among others, your work in human rights. Um, we know that there are uh, a lot of treaties and conventions related to human rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, uh, etc. But we do not have one universal, legally binding uh, human rights charter. And well, this is mainly because we do not universally agree on which rights are universal human rights. Do you think that there will ever be uh, an agreement between all states on what constitutes human rights and that there will ever be a legal document? Well, your guess is as good as mine. My first reaction is why not? We are moving more and more into a, a globalized uh, world where we are more and more beginning to um, agree on, 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 standard, on standard things. And certainly uh, a Bill of Human Rights or, or, or a Treaty of Human Rights um, is, is not something that, that one cannot foresee. For example, if we can agree on, on what constitutes torture uh, and countries can sign up to the treaty, the Convention Against Torture, um, and other things. Um, we've got several conventions on, on um, violation of, 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 of human rights, on war crimes, on, on, com on genocide and, and things like that. And, and of course, the, the, the thing is, states are famous for inventing new ways of violating human rights. Humans are famous for that as well. So I don't know, even if we came up with a, a, a bill that we would agree upon as to what constitutes uh, human rights or, and so on and so forth, would it be exhaustive is, is perhaps the question. But certainly uh, one can foresee a time in, in the future uh, where if, if this globalization continues at the rate at, at which we're, we're going, that we, we would, as a human family, agree on, on a common treaty. Well, I... Would be wonderful. I hope that you <laughs> that you are right in the future. Um, before this interview started, we briefly touched on the subject of cultural diplomacy as being uh, exchange between cultures and creating mutual understanding. Um, do you think that cultural diplomacy can play a role in this creation of a universal human rights document? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, as, as long as human rights con and, and states continue to think that armed conflict is a solution or the solution. And of course, th there's the current global challenge of terrorism. You see, you, you cannot have cultural diplomacy where people or states are not willing to sit at a table and listen to each other. You need to, w cultural diplomacy only works where civilized people sit around a table and talk to each other and listen to each other. As long as you have radical people that do not even want to consider that anyone else different than them 
has an equally valid way of doing things. You cannot have cultural diplomacy. And frankly speaking, I don't know um, whether in the, in the face of, of world terrorism and insecurity, sometimes of a faceless terrorist, some of these people, you, you, you do not know who they are. You hear about a group calling themselves thus and thus. They, they don't have leaders, or they do have leaders, the leaders are in hiding, perpetually. They do not have an agenda that is known, it's a hidden agenda. So where do you start sitting with them? And these are the real powers at play now in threatening world security. If only you know, states and people and groups could come out in the open and say, this is our agenda, this is what we, we want, we want to sit and negotiate with whoever is different with us and see if we can peacefully coexist. That would be ideal. But I'm not sure that we are living in an ideal world where this is possible. It's going to take a while. And you know, the, the reverse side of the coin is the people seeking peace to, 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 um, to build peace. Can they do so through cultural diplomacy with an unseen enemy? with somebody that, that they cannot talk to or negotiate with, um, or who does not speak the same language of peace as them. How far can cultural diplomacy go in fostering world peace then is the big question. And frankly, I don't have any answers for that. Well, I guess that's what we're trying to do at the Institute, also f um, fostering the dialogue between people and trying to talk about this but yeah unfortunately the the people that we're trying to reach out to are not the people that are in this room today so that yeah but, but you know what um, the more I mean we, we all hear things in the news and so on and and we don't quite understand where it's coming from or where it's going but I've, of, I've often thought to myself I think the best way to understand a person is to go where that person lives and see how they live why they live, why they do what they do. Maybe part of, of understanding the, 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 the separatists, the, the, the extremists, etc., is to study or go into where they are and find out why do they live the way they live and start changing them from within rather than crushing them down with arms and ammunition. I don't know if that is a solution. It's, often, it's been suggested that um, where you have, for example, um, Islamic um, extremism, probably the best person to talk to them are the Islamic moderates, mm -hmm. to go in there and understand why do they live the way they live? What really is their agenda? What are they trying to say to the rest of the world? Perhaps that would be a place to start, uh, your cultural diplomacy, and, and to see if, you know, one can speak a language that can be heard, and one can invite them to the table and draw them to a discussion table. Or oh, that would, wouldn't that be a glorious day if that could happen? So that you know people could start talking instead of, of plotting to fight each other, really. I think that that would be the best. Yes, I, I definitely agree with you. I just think it's, it's also really difficult to get them to the table, not only because they are hiding, but also because the people that are yeah, trying to talk to them are usually Western people. And if we talk about Islamic extremism, this is usually directed against the West. So it, I guess it, it would be best if you find some middle person who starts the initial discussion. The, the other thing, though, is, is I think I would be hypocritical if I did not draw upon my own region, where I come from, where we've had insurgencies. Okay, they are not terrorists in the global sense of the word, but they are insurgencies and they're just as dangerous um, as, as, as the extremists um, globally. These, these are groups of, of renegade um, former military personnel or self-styled militias who've just decided that they're going to wage war. Nobody understands um, their agenda. One of them, for instance, is, is the Lord's Resistance Army in in Uganda and Central Africa that that have been in existence for nearly 30 years and have eluded everybody and they have committed untold atrocities 
Nobody knows why they do this, but nobody seems to be able to stop them. There have been, negotiate, been attempts to negotiate with them and to call them to the table. They're very elusive. So at the end of the day, you wonder how far cultural diplomacy can go with groups like that and whether you can blame um, military efforts aimed at actually catching these people and bringing them to justice because that's, that's what we need to do. I think. Yes, there's also the possibility of using the combination of cultural diplomacy or soft power together with mm. hard power and yes. yeah, what John I calls smart power. Mm. So um, yeah, it's definitely something that should be tried. Um, I would like to now turn to your current work at the uh, International Court of Justice, where um, it's in my experience the, the most cases are about legal conflicts between states. Um, is there any room for, the, for a judge of the International Court of Justice to, to engage in cultural diplomacy? Um, it's pretty much a, a, a law world, if I got that correct. Um, oh, oh, there's nothing to prevent us as individuals, um, like from where we come, to participate in, in, um, in, in, in like what we're doing now in this conference, giving a talk here or a talk there and so on and so forth. But I think the court in a way <coughs> does, does in, a, in a way engage in cultural diplomacy in, in the judgment sometimes. Um, in, in that when, when states opt to bring their disputes to the court, that's not the only option they had. They have other options. They, they could go to war, for instance. Uh, but they choose, they choose not to do that. And moreover, when they do come to court, um, they, the, the, the court is very sensitive to the diplomatic relations between the two countries. Even when we're giving the judgments, we often appeal to the two parties beyond the judgment to consider the greater good of their peoples. We've, the court has done this very, very often. So the court does not operate in a, vi in a vacuum. They, they, do, they are sensitive to the, the, the cultural and diplomatic um, uh, undertones of any dispute, and they try to encourage that. As I said in my speech this morning, a judgment of the court is never an end to the conflict. Uh, it's when the parties, if the parties accept the judgment of the court, which is binding to them, but that no one can force a state to abide by the judgment of the court. If they refuse, that's it. Uh, so states often, through a lot of diplomacy, diplomatic interaction, um, will eventually give uh, effect to the judgments of the court. Or sometimes the UN itself, through its other organs, have helped to to bring the parties together using the judgment of the court as the standard and to say okay guys let's let's try and bring this dispute to an end we'll help you we'll give you some neutral experts to help you and so on and so forth and and in that way um, judicial <coughs> and diplomatic efforts have come together judicial political and diplomatic efforts have come together uh, to resolve that particular dispute so yes the court does does is sensitive to the diplomatic, diplomatic aspects of, of the disputes. Okay, that's very interesting to hear for someone who thought it's only based on the, the purely legal aspects of uh, judging the conflict. Um, if I'm correct, your term in office as a judge uh, ends in 2021. Um, if you look at the development of international law in general and you look at uh, cultural diplomacy and cultural exchange between countries. How do you think that this exchange between people and mutual understanding uh, influences international law? Or who, how do you think that international law will develop in this aspect? Um, of course, international law is, is always growing and developing de depending on um, the various subject matters of, of, of the disputes that are brought before us. Um, of course, we're mindful also of the old cases, and the court tries to be consistent uh, with decisions that, that have been made in the past, and will only depart um, from a decision where it's necessary and giving reasons to depart. Um, but I think more and more in a globalized world, 
um, the court will find itself, I, I was giving an example this morning of, of the, the, the Namibian case, mm -hmm. where way back in, in um, the, the, the 21st century, the first tw 21st century, when the case first came to the ICJ, the judges did not think it funny or odd or unpopular even that they would dismiss such an important case on a technicality that these two independent states had no standing, no locus standi to bring an important matter, like a matter for self-determination before the court. And they said there was no standing and that was the end of the matter. They didn't even look at the fact that here was a group of people, Southwest Africa, who, whose right to self-determination was being violated and who didn't, in the eyes of the UN, exist as a nation and therefore would never have standing. So like this was a vicious cycle. That, that they never thought of that. Later on, however, as time passed, two decades, two and a half decades later, and with a lot of criticism from the international community, the court changed. And they then agreed with the Security Council that, that the, the people of Southwest Africa did have a right to self-determination and that the, the, the regime in South Africa was, was in contravention of, of their international obligation uh, to recognize and respect this right. So what changed? The people of Southwest Africa were still the people of Southwest Africa. They were not yet independent. But the court's decision had changed being sensitive to the trend of things that were happening. And I think every court should be sensitive to the, the, the trend of thinking and the, the trend of things in the world, in a globalized um, world. Otherwise, the court can easily find itself irrelevant, redundant. And, and if, if you do that, you find that your judgments are not respected and this can happen in, inside a country or in an international court like the ICJ. It can very easily happen. S so to answer your question, I think over the years, as, as times pass, not just you know, for 20, uh, 2021, but as time passes, I think the challenge for the court and for the judges is to ensure that we keep ourselves relevant. We don't necessarily have to be popular, but we need to be sensitive to the trends um, the global trends. We need to be sensitive to, to human rights issues and, and, um, and generally to, to human rights and to cultural diplomacy. We need to be relevant. Okay, well, on that positive note, I would like to thank you again very much for spending time here and giving uh, us the interview. And I want to thank you for your contribution to this uh, event on cultural diplomacy. And uh, I hope you have a pleasant stay in Berlin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.